as the children are being dismissed to kids' worship, you can be turning your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. And you also, we're talking about prayer, but you need to be praying about your role in kids' worship. And the reason I say you need to pray about your role in kids' worship because Scripture talks about how a generation is to teach the younger generation. Now, chances are you are not the generation under the kids' and children's worship, which means their knowledge of Scripture and of God and is your responsibility and my responsibility. So you need to pray about the role that you need to take in children's worship. And you can talk to us about that if you're interested in serving in there. Um, and I pray that you would. So Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 21. So if you turn with me there, let's, let's read together. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, it says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length, the width, height, and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Let's pray. Fathers, we come to your word at this time and we open it and we read it. We ask that you would open our minds to understand. You would open our hearts to receive and to love it. Lord, that we'll not just be hearers of your word, but we'll allow it to take deep roots into our hearts, into our lives, and we'll become doers of your word as you have called us to do. So Lord, we ask that you touch us. You open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, and open our hearts to love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning we're going to be talking about prayer. Now, this finishes up chapter 3, and as we talked about, Ephesians is broken into two sections, basically. Chapters 1 through 3 are all this idea of, it's, it's the heart and mind of what we believe and what we embrace as Christians. And then you got chapters 4 through 6, that are the practical, the things that we actually do in response to chapters 1 through 3. So this is kind of our last little section in getting our minds right and how we view God, how we view salvation, how we view the world. And starting next week, we'll get into how we actually put these things to practice. So if you're one of those that's overly practical, you're like, hey, I need something practical, starting next week, you will love the next sections of Ephesians in chapters 4 through 6 because that talks about how we live our lives and how we put to practice what God has taught us in chapters 1 through 3. But here, this last part of chapter 3 is a prayer. Now, this is the second prayer that we see Paul praying for the church of Ephesus. If you go back to chapter 1, you can see the first prayer. And then here in chapter 3 is the second prayer. Now, prayer is a very important and valuable part of your walk with God. All right, Prayer is a gift given to us by God's grace and mercy. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but prayer is a gift that God has given us. See, prayer is not a tool in which we use to try to talk God into doing what we want Him to do. See, we were created to have fellowship with God. We're, we're, we're created to have this relationship with Him, and prayer is one of those tools that we've been given to know God more, to know His character more, to to have a heart connection with Him. Prayer is basically one of those ways that we connect our heart to God's heart. Prayer, reading scriptures, there's going to church, there's many things, but today we're talking about that idea of prayer. Prayer is one of those tools that you use to deepen your fellowship and your relationship with your Heavenly Father. 
And you can't deepen your relationship with your Heavenly Father without prayer. Prayer plays an important role in your life. So we're going to look at someday, today, we're going to look at some things that we can pray specifically for, for ourselves and for others. And we're going to look at how Paul prayed and use that as a model of how we should pray. So first of all, let's look at verse 16 together again. It says for this um, in verse 14, we'll get down to verse 16 and focus on that. It says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. In verse 16 it says, I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his Spirit. Man typically looks on the outside. But see, God looks on the inside. He looks at the heart. But see, we spend so much of our time focused on the outward physical world that we miss this idea that we're to be growing the inner being of us. We're to be growing our spirit and our soul. Think about your drive home today, wherever you may live. Think about the things that you will pass. And, I, and I'm going to ask you to do that. When you go home today, I want you to notice these things and see how much of it you pass and, and maybe come up with a list on your own. But... As I drive back and forth to work and I drive around town, I notice some of these places. I notice that we have nail places, we have spas, we have places where you can go get a tan. That way you don't have to go outside, but you can get a tanning bed. We have clothing stores, grocery stores, restaurants, gyms, car dealerships. We have, in our culture and society, we have plastic surgeons, we have dentists. We have all these services in our communities. Something these, all these services have in common is they're temporary fixes. Now, those things aren't bad. I mean, we should go to the dentist, right? That should be some, that's something that's good. But what all these things tell us and remind us of is that life is, this physical life that we have is temporary. It's passing. It's not eternal. It's not going to last forever. It's not like you can clip your nails once and then you're good. I mean, I guess you don't have to clip your nails all the time, but that's, that would be kind of gross. I don't know. I've looked that up before where it's like the longest fingernails. If you have a weak stomach, don't, don't look that up. But they're like, they, they grow and they're like, like 10 feet long and they curl. And I'm kind of like, cut, cut your nails. Just cut your nails. Right? But the thing is, is you have to do that all the time, right? And it's not like you can just eat one meal and then, hey, I'm good forever. Now you've got to keep eating. And then it's not like you can go to the dentist once when you're a kid and be like, okay, good. I never have to go back again. Well, you're going to have problems if you never go back to the dentist again. This life is continuously reminding us that this physical world is temporary. Nothing lasts forever. Nothing is eternal. On my list, I put car dealerships. Anybody ever tried to buy a car before and you just walked away and been like, that was so pleasant. I am going to do this every week. Right? Yeah. Oh, it's just like... Wait, how much did you say again? Okay, I thought this used to cost only like, what, what happened? Um, every now and then, I like to go to a car dealership just to look at the price of the newest and biggest trucks. Don't know why. I just like to. And over the years, I've noticed that that price keeps inching further and further north of zero. And it's not getting cheaper. So me getting a big, nice truck is getting further and further away. But, you know, I remember the first time I saw one that broke $90,000. And I was like, oh, man. You know, it's just, you're just kind of like, man. And that, you spend $90,000 on that truck, and it's just not going to last forever. It, I don't know about your expectations in life, but I feel like if I pay more than $10, it should last until I die. I don't know. You know, you go, you go buy a washer and dryer, and like, this should be the last one I ever buy. This year. And then it's... But see, this life reminds us time and time again that this physical world is temporary. And we see here that Paul is praying specifically for the people of Ephesus. Now remember, when he's praying for the people of Ephesus, remember where they're at. All right? They're in the hotbed. They're like in the epicenter of the Roman Empire of pagan worship. All right? They're beaten. They're imprisoned. They're ridiculed. They're, you know, these, this is the place where mobs were called together to try to run the Christians out. And so the Christians are facing extreme persecution. They're being imprisoned. They're going hungry because people are trying to starve them out. All these things are happening at the 
at the church in Ephesus. And so Paul is going to pray for them. And he prays, I pray, not that you will be delivered from persecution, not that you never have to face hardship anymore, but he's praying, I'm praying that you be strengthened with the power in your inner being through the Spirit. We get consumed with the outward things of this world, with the physical things. But God is consumed with the spiritual things. And he's praying, I'm praying that you be strengthened with the power in your inner being through the Spirit. Your spirit and your soul is of far more value than your physical body. It's of far more value. But if we're honest, we spend far more time on our physical body than we do our spiritual. And then we wonder... What's happened? We wonder a lot of times the, the, the phrase I hear over and over again in, in our culture, in our place and time is like, what has happened to our country? Well, that's easy. We cared more about our physical appearance and the physical things of this world than we did about our spirits. That's what went wrong. If you ever wonder what's went wrong with this country, that's it. We care too much about the physical and too little about the spiritual. It's all about how we look and how we experience this life. And we're not thinking about eternity and the things that will last forever. Jesus said, hey, don't store up treasures here on earth because they're just going to fade and pass away, but store up treasures in heaven. God has always had this idea of like he cares more about your spirit than he does about your physical body. So Paul understanding the scriptures and understanding the heart of God, begins to pray for the church of Ephesus and he prays that you be strengthened with power in the inner being through the Spirit. So if you want to know, okay, well, how do I pray for myself and how do I pray for others? Step one is you pray for the Spirit first. Their inner being. That's where you spend your time praying. And then he continues on. Verse 17. All right, look at me here. The first part of 17, and he says, And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That word dwell there, your translation may use a different word, but kind of all goes back to the same root Greek word. But that idea of their dwell in your hearts is the idea of a permanent resident. Someone that comes in and takes ownership of a place. Now, I don't know, anybody ever rented a place before? Yeah, you ever, you, you know, you, you, you live there, you have your stuff there, but it never quite feels like it's yours. That's because it's not, right? It's not yours. And so there's a temporary feeling when you rent. See, God has not come in to indwell your, your life as a renter. He's not there just kind of like, ah, we'll see how it goes. God has come in, and when you're a believer, he indwells you, and he says up permanent residence in the sense that he owns it, it's his, it's his possession that he will never leave, but that he will care for. So he's praying that, you're, that Christ may dwell in your hearts, may take permanent residence in your heart. Now there is a little bit difference when it comes to renting a house and owning a house, right? Well, I guess technically... There's a difference between you renting a house and living in a house that the bank te technically owns. But one day you hope to own it, right? That's where I'm at. The bank technically owns my house, but I think I do. So I'm just going to go with the fact that I think I do, right? Well, there's a different mindset when you own it and when you rent it. When you own it, now you're kind of like, oh, that broke. Well, who do I call? I guess I have to call myself. See, before when we rented, it was easy. Oh. Hey, uh, landlord, your, your stove broke. Now it's like when the stove breaks, I'm like, who needs stoves, right? <laughs> it's just microwave, right? You know, there's, there's a whole different mindset when it comes to renting and owning and all these things. So when, when God comes in, I want you to think for me, think with me for just a moment. Think about buying a fixer-upper, a house that needs help. Anybody ever watch like those home repair TV shows or anything like that on TV and stuff like that. Guys, I know it's, sometimes it's on those girly channels and we may not make it over there very much. But I really like watching those home improvement shows where they come into the house. Anybody ever seen This Old House? 
TV show a little bit. These, these guys come in, they start fixing it, they explain what they're doing. I'm like, oh, the way they're explaining I think I can do that. But then I find out quickly I cannot. But I love watching the transformation they do in these homes. Now, we see the transformation and it takes 30 minutes on TV, but in reality it takes quite a bit longer. But man, I still love watching those transformations. They take this place that just looks, you walk into it, and you, they walk into it and you're like, man, that looks terrible. But then they start, they, they start replacing the walls, the light fixtures, they start replacing the floors, they bring in all this new furniture, and you're like, ah, oh, that looks amazing. And it's a transformation. They transform the home from what it was to what it is. And see, that's what Christ does to us as believers. He comes in, He indwells us, and then He transforms us. Romans 12, 2 tells us that, that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Christ comes to indwell you to transform you. But think about how it does with a house being transformed. It takes time. And sometimes in your mind you think, oh, yeah, we'll come into this house and, oh, yeah, a few months we'll be there. And then after a few years you're like, a few more months we'll be there. And then a few more years go back, ah, just a few more months. Right? You know how that goes, right, Josiah? I mean, it's just like you have all these plans and it's like it's, then kids get in the way and you're kind of like, oh, yeah. And then months turn into years and all that kind of stuff, trying to fix up a house and things like that. Well, that's how it is for you spiritually as well. You can't just get saved and expect everything to fall into place all at once and everything to be perfect. What happens is, is Christ indwells you and then He begins transforming you over time. And so that's what Paul is praying for the people here at Ephesus, that Christ will indwell your hearts and that He will transform you over time into the image of Christ. Again, that goes back to that inner being, that spirit. He's one... You know, God is more concerned with that spirit that you're being transformed. Just because you get saved doesn't mean things are going to be perfect for you. It takes time. It's just like we're in our house. We have all these ideas with our house. Like, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do, and I'm going to do this over here, and this is going to be great. And then reality sets in that I'm busy, I don't have time, and then it's kind of like, wait, we're ha- what happened to my money? Then I look at my six kids, and I'm like, that's where my money went. And all these things, and just life happens. Well, as you're going along in your Christian life, you're going to have ups, and you're going to have downs. You're going to have sometimes upside downs. You're going to feel like, well, I'm not making any progress. And what's happening in my life? And you got to remember, you got to look at the, the long-term plan. We're praying that Christ will indwell our hearts, that He'll take residence, and that He'll begin transforming us over time to become like Christ. That's what we need to be praying for ourselves, and that's what we need to be praying for others. The idea that Christ takes permanent residence and He's there for the long haul to transform you. Christ in your life is not temporary. It's not like He steps in, saves you, and then steps out. He's a permanent resident that indwells you and transforms you over time. And so that's what Paul's praying for, that they'll realize this and that Christ will indwell their hearts. All right, so let's continue. Let's look what else to pray for in verse 17 through 19. So finishing up verse 17, it says here, I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. To know Christ's love. He's praying that they would know Christ's love. Now, there's different levels of knowing. All right? There's different levels of knowing someone. All right? Right now, you know, you, you put a scale of 1 to 10 as far as y'all knowing me and me knowing y'all. It's, it's probably like what? Right, right around a 2 because of time, right? We just haven't, the more we know each other, the more around each other, that will increase, right? We'll, we get to know each other on a deeper level. I started thinking about that. Well, like, um, I started thinking about how we know people and what levels and things like that. And today, with the internet and social media, we feel like we can know people pretty well. But the reality is, is I don't think we know each other and know people as well as we used to. Our level of knowing has begun to diminish. 
follow me for just a second and let me explain that. So because of the internet and social media and those things like that, I can feel like I know celebrities pretty well. All right. So how many of y'all personally know Justin Timberlake? Anybody personally know him? Yeah? Huh? Well, not personally, but you know, he's a singer, right? He's a famous singer. He was in a boy band, and now he, he sings. He's on the, all the talk shows and things like that. He's pretty popular. Well, I think I know him pretty good, right? I can think about it. I can know, because of Google, I can know where he was born, when he was born. I can know his birthday. I can know his likes, his dislikes. I can know his favorite foods, all those things. And it helps that Cammie's aunt and uncle lived across the street from his mom when he was growing up, and Cammie's cousins and him played together. So Cammie's cousins and stuff played with Justin growing up, all right? And so in his, you know, the uncle and her aunt and uncle lived across the street from him. I've been to her aunt and uncle's house. I've, you know, I've, you know, I've seen where he grew up and all that kind of stuff and everything like that. And you can be like, man, I, well, we can know him pretty good, right? Because he grew up right here in Tennessee. I can know a lot of facts about him, but that doesn't mean I know him, Right? There's levels of knowing. The problem with Christianity sometimes is, is we get this idea with like, well, I'm going to learn a bunch of facts about God, and then somehow we think we know Him. But we're missing a heart connection. I can know a lot of facts about people these days. You know, LeBron James, famous basketball player. Again, I can know, because of social media, I can know where he ate yesterday. I can know his favorite foods, dislikes. Like, I can know all these things about him. But that doesn't mean I know him. This word know here in, in Scripture carries this idea of complete and full knowledge of. Like an intimate knowing of. See, there's a certain level that you can get to know me, but you will never be able to know me as, no, as much as my wife knows me. And there's a certain level y'all can get of knowing Cammy, but you will never know her like I know her. Because there's an intimacy there that we have in our relationship over years that you, don't, you will not have. But see, God, even though he seems like he's so separate from us, he's, he's holy, he's, he's reigning in heaven and all these things, we think, well, there's a certain point where I can get and that's as far as I can know. But no, God, through Christ, has made it where we can know God fully and completely. Not just know about him, but know him personally. As a father. So Paul is praying that they know that they the fullness and the deepness of the love of Christ. God wants you to know him. Not just about him. Not just some basic facts. But he wants to he wants you to know him as a child knows his father, and as a father knows his child. That's what Paul's praying for. So if we look at what Paul's praying for, he's praying that they're strengthened within the inner being. They're pray, he's praying that, that Christ may dwell their hearts, take permanent residence and transform them. And he's praying that they will fully know and comprehend the deepness of God's love for them and that relationship that he desires for them. Why is he praying these things? Well, let's pick up at the end of verse 19 through 21. Together it says... So that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So that you may know the fullness. You may be filled with all the fullness of of God. You want a vibrant, growing, maturing faith and relationship with your Heavenly Father? Pray what Paul prayed. Pray that, you're, that you may be strengthened with the power in your inner being. Pray that Christ may take permanent dwelling residence in your life to transform you. And pray that you may comprehend and know intimately and deeply the love that God has for you in Christ. And if you notice, if you want to experience the fullness 
of God and all that He has for you, it doesn't start with the outward appearance. It doesn't start with your abilities and your capabilities. It starts with your spirit surrendering to Christ. And then He does all this work through you and for you. Because if you pay attention to chapters 1 through up to this point in 3, it's all our spiritual life, our, our worth and our value is found in Christ. He does all that work for us. He's holy on our behalf. He's righteous for us. He puts all that on our accounts. Because God cares about your spirit. Because your spirit is eternal. This physical body, which the older I get, the more thankful that I am that this spiritual body is temporary. Right? Amen? Yeah. Thankfully, this is temporary. But our spirit is eternal. So God cares about the eternal things. He cares about your spirit. So our prayers need to be focused on the inner being of who we are, our spirits. It needs to be praying for our spirits and our souls. That's what we need to be praying for ourselves and praying for others. Not saying we never pray for the physical things, because in Scripture you have people praying for the, spiritual, the physical things uh, quite often. But we can't get so consumed with the physical life that we neglect our spiritual life and our spirit and our being. Now, I've shared with you all before that I would love to run a marathon one day, especially before I'm 40. Well, every day, 40 is getting closer, and I feel like that marathon is getting longer and longer. I can start training and pour everything I am into, into running a marathon, and I could do it, you know, I, I could do it within a year. But what good would all that physical training be if I neglect my spirit, be of no value. Don't let your life be consumed with the physical so much so that you neglect your spirit. Your spirit is eternal. Your physical body, this physical life is temporary. And we can see the importance of that because you see Paul, again, the church at Ephesus, the Christians there, they're facing persecutions, imprisonments, they're being beaten, they're being tortured, all these things. Paul doesn't pray for their physical deliverance, he prays for their spiritual deliverance. Because that is of utmost value. That is the importance. Because no matter what's happened to you in this physical world, you can glorify God, you can praise Him, you can worship Him, and you can accomplish things for His glory. So it's time we start focusing a little more on our spiritual life. So Simon's going to come up again. He's going to play a little bit. We're going to do our invitation just a little bit different. As he kind of plays in the background, what you're going to do is we're going to practice what we preach this morning. We're going to pray. And I encourage you, pray for your, pray for your spirit. Pray for the spiritual things in your life, the eternal things. And then I want you to pick one other person that comes to your mind, and I want you to pray this for them as well. Pray they may be strengthened in their inner being. Christ would just dwell within them and transform them. And I pray that they would just know and know and know the love of God in Christ. And after a moment, I'll close this in prayer. Father, we come to you now and we confess it's really easy for us to be passionate and all in on the physical things of this world, the temporary things. Whether it's our favorite sports team, whether it's our favorite TV shows or whatever it may be. It's so easy for us to get distracted and to forget about the eternal things. Father, we ask that you forgive us. Lord, we thank you that we can't ask for forgiveness and you tell us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for cleansing us. 
We ask today, Lord, that you would just give us a heart and a passion and desire for the spiritual things, the eternal things, much more than the temporary. Help us when we pray that our prayers will be consumed with eternal things. When we pray for others that we will be consumed with praying for the eternal things. Or in all that we do, wherever we find ourselves at work or at home, that we will love you above all. That we'll be consumed and, and passionate about the spirits of other people. Lord, help us to remember that you desire for us to worship you. Help us remember that you desire to work in and through our lives in amazing ways that we can't even begin to describe or to know. Help us remember that those and those things is where we'll find peace and where we'll find joy and where we'll find hope. That's where we experience the fullness of salvation and of the gospel is in the eternal. Lord, we ask that you fill us with your spirit. Lord, that you would strengthen us with your power and in our inner being. We pray that you will just dwell within our hearts and transform us into the image of your son. We pray that you would just help us to know, to know, to know, to understand and comprehend the love that you have for us in Christ. We pray that you would help us to take the gospel, the good news of Jesus to all people so they too can experience the joy and the hope and the peace that we have. Lord, you truly are good to us. So we thank you for the grace and the mercy that you have given us in Christ. And help us to leave here today worshiping and glorifying you with our entire being. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good week. Begin praying for people. Pray for their spiritual well-being.